back to the modcast the ob edition kind of staff edition of what we do every single week talking about longhorn topics and you will see a couple of new faces the old face considering <laughs> him and i are old is obviously jason sukumel we've got two other guys that kind of new to us first of all got kenan womack who does all of our longhorn basketball we've got michael rockman our recruiter <laughs> extraordinary producer. We're going to wait for some people to pop in slash jump in. Uh, Keenan says you can't hear us. Is that it, Keenan? Okay. Bye. Hello? <laughs> I don't know what's, I don't know what to do with Keenan and his, uh, I got some paper to do. We'll scribble notes and hold it up to the screen. Yeah. It's like, it's going to be hostage situation here. Uh, Keenan, <laughs> Keenan, if it, if it just doesn't work, end up working out, just feel free to drop off and we will try you at, at another point. Mike, welcome to the debut. You you have been doing and producing behind the scenes for quite a, a little bit of time, just as as a way for some people to pop in. Give us an idea of how this this everything's been going for you. Yeah, everything's been good. So you know, I just recently moved down to Austin about five months ago, and kind of just kind of new to Orange Bloods and everything. And it's been really fun. I know the season maybe didn't go as everyone was hoping, but in terms of the overall process finally getting into the sports journalism field. It's been a dream come true and got to meet some great coworkers along the way. So very excited <laughs> to uh, be doing that. Yeah. Could, by, by meet, you mean talk to us through uh, Slack? Yeah, I mean, not so much they, meet me, you know. I think this is the first time I've seen Michael and Keenan's faces, dude. That's just the new world we live in, right? We don't yeah. go to offices anymore. So uh, unfortunately, I see Omar's face all too often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's no Alex because we think we think Alex is doing something in Indy, uh, but we have no clue if what he really is doing. Catch is doing catch things, so uh, let's just get the, let's get it started. You know, I was thinking, Jason, um, Jason, I'll come to you first. That you know, we've been we've talked a lot about like the what ifs of the upcoming season and things that could or you know could not occur. And I think a lot of times, Jason, when we're having a conversation. It's under the the guys that you know it's not going to happen, right? Under that, it's probably going to be seven wins or eight win kind of season, and not expecting something past that. But I thought, so, okay, let's let's take it to another level. Let let's get into the realm of of probability, you know, as opposed to the negativity there. And if I told you, you know, and I want to, we're going to go. I want to. I'm break it down specifically on offensive and defense, but from a general perspective. What do you think needs to happen for this team to be in that 10-win conversation and, and really the Big 12 championship conversation? Tell me, what do you think, you know, is will need to occur? And again, we'll, we'll go specifics. Yeah, as you're asking that question, I was like, okay, I got one thing and two things and three. Now I'm up to about five things that need to happen for mm -hmm. this team to get to 10 wins in Big 12 championship. Um, first off, they've got to have some luck. You've got to be able to win some close games. You've got to have some bounces go your way. We, it didn't happen for Texas last year. You could debate that five and seven could have been whatever, uh, eight and four or something, you know, if, if they had a couple bounces go their way, if they could close out games. So you got to have uh, some luck involved. Uh, they've got to stay healthy at key positions, which pretty – other than a team like Alabama, you know, pretty much is the case for everybody. Um, their defensive players, you and I – and Catch and Alex have talked about this recently about what is this, what are those players' ceilings? What's the best those players can be? Okay. I don't, I'm not saying all of those defensive players have to be the best that they can be, but they've got to certainly improve over last year. The defense as a whole needs to be better. That means individual players need to play better. Um, the biggest thing for me, Almar, if they're going to take that kind of jump from five and seven to 10 and two and playing in the conference championship game. You hate to put too much pressure on one guy, but it's going to come down to the quarterback position. Right. And we're assuming that's going to be Quinn Ewers. Uh, you know, you don't want to totally discount Hudson card in that discussion, but in college football, by and large, especially in the big 12, you're about as good as your quarterback play is going to be. If, if you don't have high level quarterback play, you're not going to be in the, that 10 win discussion. So, you know, Defense has to play better, a little bit of luck, some health. All those things need to come together. Uh, Bijan's got to be Bijan, of course. But ultimately, it is going to come down to whether or not Quinn Ewers, likely Quinn Ewers, can.
can carry this team to that kind of success. It's, it's going to fall on his shoulders. He's going to, he's going to have to play at a, a really high level, like what we saw Casey Thompson when Casey was at his best last year. You know, Casey played at a championship level in stints. He just was injured, of course, and didn't do it consistently. Texas needs Quinn Ewers to be really good and be really consistently good uh, if, if we're talking to that type of success, 10 wins, conference champ, com, conference championship game, and, and maybe beyond. Yeah. Uh, Michael, kind of the same question to you. If, if we're talking, you know, that this is a 10-win season, a Big 12 championship season, what would you have expected to know or what would you believe had occurred during the year for us to be on the, the flip side and the end side of that one? I think really what you'd have to expect is that the star power came through. You know, Quinn Ewers really showed himself as one of the top quarterbacks in the nation, honestly. And I know that's a very high bar to set on someone that hasn't really taken any legitimate snaps. But I think that's kind of what has to happen. You know, getting the ball to Xavier Worthy, Jordan Whittington, Isaiah Nair, making sure Bijan's been this dominant player in the run game, Roshan helping out as well. And then the defense really can't collapse on itself. I know that some of the blame could be had on the offense stalling out for why the defense gave up some of these points, but really it has to be a full, complete unit. And I think that's kind of what has to happen in order for you to have this complete team. You know, everything has to definitely be more improved than last year. The QB play has to be better. The online play has to be better. The defense has to be better. The coaching has to be better. But ultimately, I think if Texas is going to be a 10-win team or more, then the stars have to really kind of lift this team up, whether it's, you know, completely by the just picking them up and pulling them all the way, or if the entire team unit kind of falls forward and really improves as a whole. Yeah, and I'll just give my my input on that because I totally agree. Uh, I'm in line with what you just said, Mike. And, you know, I definitely – one of the things, if, if we're talking about that, that end goal, this would be, to me, a team that's closing it out in the second half and especially the fourth quarter, eliminating – what we saw last year, which was those fourth quarter collapses, you know, three times, three times you go into a fourth quarter uh, with the lead, double digit lead, uh, and then it, it doesn't happen. That that reflects on a lot of different things. I mean, that's you know clearly that's on the players, clearly that's on the coaching, especially you know if there's something that starts to permeate where it becomes that here we go again uh, kind of attitude. So if you're telling me this team is closing it out in the second half. I would totally be the person that buys into that. Now, it, when you talked about Jason, I'm going back to you. When you started talking about Quinn and the, the importance of him, is there a stat line that you would say, okay, if you told me at the end of the year, Quinn throws for this, this many touchdowns, this many interceptions, I would totally believe and buy that Texas is at, you know, the end goal. Do, do, do you have a numbers in mind? Uh, not Really, I don't have. I'm just trying to do the math in my head. If you're talking 12 games, I think in this offense with these weapons, uh, in Sark's offensive philosophy, you've got Bijan to lean on, right? So that's going to cut. It's not like they're going to maybe go out and throw the ball 50 times every game. But in Sarkeesian's offense, I mean, the quarterback's going to put up numbers. I mean, I think it's. I think realistically, he needs to average probably a little under maybe, but 300 yards a game. I think, you know, 275 or something like that per game. So, you know, calculate that over 12, um, you know, and he's just got to, he's got to protect the ball as much as anything. I mean, I don't know that he needs to throw for 3,600 yards and 25 or 30 touchdowns or something insane like that. But um, I think he's just, he's got to be very efficient in this offense. You can lean on the running game. You've got a good stable of running backs. We talk about Bijan, of course, all the time, but obviously Roshan and Jonathan Brooks and Keelan Robinson. You can rely on the running game some. I think he's got to be efficient um, in terms of overall numbers on more, but I do think he's got to be productive. I mean, I, I would say in the, uh, per game, I'm talking, like I said, about 275 yards, and you'd like to see about – a solid, I mean, solid, I would say at minimum a three to one interception ratio, but probably even, I would probably think it had to be a lot higher than that. If we're talking mm. a 10 win type of season, he's just got to protect the football as much as anything. Now, Jason, it is interesting. I looked up Casey's stats. We're talking, you know, 2,100 yards, 26 touchdowns. It looks like uh, nine and uh, 24 touchdowns and nine interceptions. Obviously some of the games that he was missed in there. 
But I mean that 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 was the the, the stat line, and maybe I can combine Hudson's right to, to be fair, and that's probably like what an overall you know twelve yeah, game sure season would look like, uh, which you know can't do that on my phone as of right now. Um, but you keep talking, I'm gonna try and pull it up. Okay, yeah. So because <laughs> if, if that was the the, the pro, what produced five, I mean uh, I I start to lean towards thinking like three thousand or more. Is is part of what you need to be looking at, you know, thirty two hundred. That that's thirty two hundred. Like that's what I start thinking in my head. You probably just talked me into it, Omar, because uh, as a team last year they threw for I'm showing twenty seven hundred, mm-hmm. uh, twenty nine touchdowns and ten interceptions. So you, you're right at that three to one touchdown to interception ratio that I mentioned, um, and that's twelve games, twenty seven hundred. So you know that that's pretty close to the yardage marker I said, but uh, yeah, I think you're probably right. They, he's going to have to play better than, than what we saw last year. You know, case again, Casey had some really, really good games, especially early on against lesser opponents. Yes. But uh, I think more than anything, if we're pointing to numbers, you know, I hate to do that because the game can dictate that so much. Um, I just think he has to be efficient. He has to protect the football um, and, and not make mistakes and, and rely on his playmakers. He's got, you know, good receivers. Obviously, obviously Xavier Worthy, Isaiah Nair coming in. I think it's going to be a fantastic. I keep saying the running game. So, you know, I don't know that we have to see Quinn Ewers put up Heisman finalist type numbers for this team to be successful. I just think he's got to be efficient, not make mistakes. And I think in this offense, though, in, in this Steve Sarkeesian offense, you do that, you're going to put up pretty good numbers. You're going to, probably be one of the leading passers in, in the conference. Yeah. Michael, what would you, let's switch. I'll, I'll give you the running back topic from a productivity standpoint. Are, are there numbers specifically that you say Bijan should have Roshan should have, um, you know, Keelan Robinson should have, like, is there, is there numbers in your head that you say, if I see this, I know at the end of the day, Texas has achieved, you know, like I said, they're, they're in that you know, in, in, maybe it's a bad, let's just say in the title game. I mean, that's the goal, right? That's not sugar coated. The goal really isn't 10 wins to be in a title game. Um, and chips forward in mind, what would you say to that, Mike? I'd say you're probably looking at around 1800 yards between that top three trio of Bijan, Roshan, and, and Keelan Robinson. So, you know, whether that's Bijan putting up 1200 or if that's Roshan getting in a larger chunk and Bijan maybe taking a more limited role to make sure that he's going to be healthy for the duration of the season. Really, I'm looking at 1,800 for the total running back room and really just consistent play. I mean, we're, we're pretty confident that the running back room is going to be one of the stronger units when it comes to this next season. But as long as this offensive line holds up, that's really probably the only concern that we have for this run game. If I told you that the running backs are going to perform almost carbon copy as last year, you'd probably be pretty optimistic in that regard because that was one of the only units that really stood out as a strength of the team last last season. Uh, by the way, Ken, is your mic working? I just want to make sure. Yeah. You hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Just, just, was, All just right. making sure you're here, all right? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Sorry about that, guys. That's okay. All right. Jason, let me go back to you. Um, offensive line. Uh, now, obviously, it's – it's kind of hard to mess, maybe to talk about like what should be you know from a, a st- statistical standpoint, um, but what would you want to see idealistically out of the out, out of the O line? Um, no, you know to know this is a, 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 a very successful unit. Uh boy, that's a, yeah. It's it's kind of subjective when you're talking offensive line. That's hard to quantify. But um, keep Quinn yours uh, off his ass, you know, and uh, keep him healthy. Mm. Uh, or Hudson, you know, I keep, we keep saying Quinn, 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 Quinn. I mean, I hate to totally discount Hudson. I mean, you know, so keep whoever's back there upright, uh, off their butts, keep them healthy. Um, I think it's an offensive line, Omar, that's going to take some lumps early on. We're expecting some young guys to be kind of thrown to the wolves. Uh, who knows, maybe game one. Um, I think it's an offensive line that I'll say this. I think it's a, a, a unit that probably needs to finish the season a lot better than maybe it starts the season. But if you're talking, you know, DJ Campbell, if you're talking Kelvin Banks, uh, Cam Williams, if any of these guys or multiple of them are thrown into the starting lineup, be it game one or game four or game five, whatever it might be, uh, 
I think that offensive line has to progressively get better. Kyle Flood's shown, you know, he's, he's obviously a great developer of talent, so he's got a history of doing that. But, um, you know, I don't think the offensive line, you can count on it being a strength of this team. I mean, Bijan's going to have to get his tough yards like we've seen him do in the past. He's going to have to run through contact, finish runs, uh, same with Roshan Johnson. Quinn Ewers, Hudson Card, they're going to have to make quick decisions with the football probably uh, a, a lot of the time. I mean, this is a line I think that's going to take have some growing pains but if you can see it continue to get better, especially with some of those young guys getting more and more experience, uh, I think that would be a, certainly a positive development for Texas that could help this team have success. You know, uh, Michael, I'll ask you about the defense in a second. The thing I was also thinking about as a transition is, you know, the tight end room also, you know, Jason, like Jaleel Billingsley comes in, but they also still have. You know, guys who, you know, we thought were pretty good from, you know, from last year. You still have the Juan Davis. You still have Jatavian, you know, uh, that's there. So, you know, then you still have Gunnar Helm, obviously, is another one. So, you know, it's it's a weird one, you know, Jason, just because I don't know who the one guy that's supposed to emerge from that room. Because Jaleel, we've heard so many good things about him, you know. Jatavian still was a five-star at, at one point. So, I mean, we know he's got skill and maybe – the the folklore of everything he did in high school, um, you know, I don't, you know, maybe that, I, I don't know, we, we haven't seen it here on a, on this level, but we all believe he's so good. What do you even make of the the tight end room? And and you know, is there one guy? If, is is there one guy you think Jason that would stand out, or is it just might be by committee at some point? Yeah, you know what, See, you know me, Omar. I'm like, dude, you got to show me something first. I mean, you, you <laughs> said, hey, they got good people there, Juan Davis. Uh, Gunner Helm and Jatavian Sanders combined for one catch last year, dude. I'm, it was I'm one amazing I, catch, I think. <laughs> I can't call it. It was my Juan Davis. Yeah, I can't. Um, I can't classify any of those guys as even remotely close to being good yet. I mean, yeah, we know what J Jatavian's recruiting pedigree was, right? We think he'll be really good. Gunner Helm, we heard good things about him last year, but he never contributed. So, um, I need to see a lot more from that room before I'm even ready to say it's even average. Okay. Um, I do think adding Jaleel Billingsley, I think I mentioned this last week or the week before when we were talking tight ends or something, I don't remember how, how the, the specifics of the conversation, but I remember saying, I think he's going to be the guy at the end of the year. If we're looking at the stat sheet, it's going to be, be Jaleel Billingsley. I mean, he's an upperclassman. He's played at a championship program in Alabama. You know, you can, talk to people at Alabama and they might give you different versions of how productive he was or how successful he was, or maybe he didn't work as hard or they thought this, that, or the other. I mean, the reviews weren't always a hundred percent glowing of Jaleel Billingsley when he came to Austin, when I talked to people that, that covered him in Alabama, but I still think he's going to be the best of the bunch that Texas has and probably the most productive of yours. If you're talking about tight end room, taking significant strides, I think it starts with Jaleel Billingsley. And then probably maybe Jatavian uh, chipping in there at some point too. But I, I think it's going to sink or swim on, on Billingsley. Michael, go back to um, what you just had on the screen by Terrence Brown. And I'm going to direct that, that question to you. I mean, and it's early. Okay, we don't know who the starting lineup for, uh, you know, the Texas Longhorns is, is going to be. Uh, we still expect that no matter who's starting, it's they're going into a heavyweight uh, battle against Bama. I mean, do you think Hal Flood could get this line to a point where it could survive four quarters against Alabama? I mean, we just saw them last year struggling against the Arkansas team with a three-man front. So we we already know what can happen again with this team versus an SEC team. Your thoughts on Bama and, and, and this Texas offensive line? This, this is on the screen, and thank you for asking, Terrence. Yeah, so when it comes to Alabama, I mean, Will Anderson, Dallas Turner, probably going to be – the best edge rushing duo in college football. So for Texas, they have to find a way to survive long enough on the interior. Jake Majors has to step up in a major way. Junior Anglau has to get, you know, quality play. They got to find a way to really kind of keep the big guys out of it. DJ Dale, um, you know, LeBron Ray, other guys like that on the interior defensive line. They can't really have an impact. Will Anderson's going to wreck it no matter who you are. I don't care if you're a struggling Texas line or if you're, a first-round offensive tackle prospect, you're going to have your issues. Dallas Turner probably going to do the same. So Texas has to operate in a very quick passing game. They have to find a way to make Quinn Ewers make decisions within the first two, three seconds. 
And if you can find a way to hold up on the interior with your veteran offensive lineman, you know, Jake Majors, Jr. Engelau kind of leading the way, helping out in that regard, then there is a chance that the offense can get moving. I mean, you have the talent in terms of weapons and just overall pieces to where you can find success early in the play, but you have to make sure that you're operating in a system where you're not allowing Will Anderson four seconds to get to your QB or else that's going to be a product of disaster. Jason, how impressive is it when you got someone new on for the first time and they start dropping like the two deep on another exactly. program? I mean, that that that's pretty that 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 says a lot, right? If you talk about a flex, that's a hell of a flex over there, man. I can so barely like, keep up who's on the Texas roster. Or who's <laughs> and, uh, I was doing cheat sheet just for that. But yeah. <laughs> Let's go stay on the defensive side. Uh my, you know, from a defensive line production. For this season to be successful, what more, what more do, would you want to see from that defensive line for Texas? I think it really comes down to what happens on the edge. And I know a lot of people are set on, oh, Sean Mathis is going to come in, you know, be this high caliber edge rusher. But he had a little bit of a down season last year. Uh, Texas overall just didn't really get the progression that they wanted. Keandre Coburn was a nose tackle that had to pass first upside, was considered to be an NFL prospect and someone that people thought were really going to kind of take that next step. He regressed a little bit. Alfred Collins is a guy that, you know, before I even came to Orange Woods, I was hearing about Alfred Collins as this, oh, two years from now, keep out, keep an eye out for this guy because he's going to be an absolute stud. He didn't really make those steps. So the defensive line has to make their steps. The edge rush needs some sort of presence on the outside. You know, someone getting – at least like six sacks just to have that kind of presence on the outside. And, you know, if you can get that combination where the interior where your strength is supposed to be takes those next steps and then the edge actually gets some sort of presence, sets the edge in the run game, gets some pass rush presence, then there's a real opportunity for Texas' defense to really kind of make those steps forward. Jason, who are some of the, you know, from a recruiting perspective, there's, you know, I think there's a couple of guys maybe on on campus now who – who are some young guys on the defensive line that you think could come in and have an and have an impact just based off of what you saw from them and their product productivity on you know in high school? Yeah, if we're talking the freshmen, I mean you start with Justice Finkley, probably, right? Mm -hmm. Uh tremendously talented. <clears throat> um, a bit undersized by normal standards, but this is a guy that's gonna do everything he can to make up for that undersized uh, aspect. In anywhere else he can with work ethic, uh, you know, just doing the right things, being coachable. Uh, he's an early enrollee, which is going to help him. So I would start – it probably starts and mostly ends with Justice Finkley. Uh, Jamon Tapp is a guy out of Louisiana, tremendously um, athletic and just kind of comes in college ready in terms of his size and build and athleticism. Probably a bit raw. So, I mean, you know, he's going to enroll this summer. So we'll see how quickly he can get up to speed. Uh, Jare Bledsoe is an interesting one, Omar. You know, he didn't play his senior year of high school, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. he transferred and different UIL stuff. Um, this is a guy that was, when coming out of his junior year, was regarded as one of the top players in the country. I mean, he was top 50 overall in the country. So this is an elite prospect, but he hasn't played football in over a year. Now, he did enroll early. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's going through the winter conditioning program, which I think is huge in spring conditioning for him because – he did lose some of his conditioning, uh, some of his, uh, you know, just ability to, to kind of just stamina, I guess is the word I'm looking for. But um, I think Jerry Bledsoe would be a, an interesting guy to watch if he can really kind of get back into shape pretty quickly. Like I said, he'll be there this spring. He'll be there all summer. So uh, those would be some of the guys. I mean, I look at the list. Zach Swanson's a, uh, a, a, a big physical player, defensive lineman out of uh, – that they, they took – out of Arizona that, you know, could play inside, could play it outside. Chris Ross, a D tackle, Aaron Bryant's another early enrollee. So they've got strength in numbers, I guess, Almar is a way to answer that. Mm -hmm. You just need a couple of those guys to actually step up. If I'm, if I'm picking a couple, it would probably be, it'd be Finkley is who I'd start with. And then I think I'd probably look, if we're talking true freshman, maybe Jamon Tapp, uh, maybe Jerry Bledsoe for the simple fact that he's enrolled early and he was just a tremendous prospect, but he's he's going to have to get up to speed pretty quickly. And Jason, stay, same with you. When we think of the linebackers, is it really on the Marvion? Like, are we are we saying okay, 
this guy needs to have, you know, 110 tackles, 120 tackles. I mean, like, are we basically saying he's got to be one of the best linebackers in the Big 12 and one of the better ones in the country if we're talking about this team being, you know, in the, in the title game? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think there's any question uh, DeMarvion's going to have to carry the big bulk of that load. I don't know who else it would be. I mean, if Brockermeyer's healthy, I mean, he'll be in the mix. David Benda, Jalen Ford. I mean, those are guys that I don't think you can count on them at this point. I think DeMarvion you can count on. Um, you know, I'll have it in the war room tonight, Omar. I mentioned on the board on Monday or Tuesday, whatever. Tuesday, I think it was. Texas is talking to – there's a uh, graduate transfer linebacker uh, out of West Virginia, uh, Josh Chandler Samedo is his name. Mm-hmm. Two last names always throws me off. But uh, this is a guy that was tied for second in the Big 12 last year in tackles. Mm-hmm. Um, so if they can get him, mm-hmm. first you got to get him on campus. You got to win his recruitment as a transfer. You know, that that could be a guy that could be – you could plug in, I think, right alongside DeMarvion. He's an inside guy. He could be ultra productive there. So um, – but right now, you know, we're talking about guys that are on the roster – yeah, it's Demarvion, and then it's a pretty big drop after that. So to answer your question, yeah, Demarvion's got to be one of the, if not the best linebacker in the Big Twelve. And you know, Demarvion was fine; he was good last year. But I think he would probably tell you, hey, he left some stuff on the table too. He could make more big plays. So yeah, there's certainly room for improvement for for Demarvion Overshawn as well. Mike, any opinion on, on the linebacker room or anything Jason just talked about? Yeah, I think Overshone has to be great, but I think what's important is that Texas has to address this position in the transfer portal. I think Jalen Ford can be a solid piece and possibly even a starter for this team, but I do think that the depth is absolutely necessary, especially with some of the injuries that Texas has had over the years. You know, Rockermeyer was fine, but there were a lot of issues in terms of just giving up big plays, and that's something that the Texas defense just cannot have. You know, it's so easy to scheme and find ways to avoid star players, so if we only have Overshone as a guy that we're talking about in this linebacker unit, then there's going to be some issues for this Texas defense, especially in that front seven. And I think it's absolutely crucial that they look to the portal, whether it's getting the uh, Chandler Tomato or someone else in the transfer portal in the spring. It's absolutely crucial that Texas goes out and adds some more talent to the position. And then Jason, throw back to you. The last, the last one would be the, the secondary, right? And, you know, it's interesting, Jason, because last year we, we entered in with a lot of high hopes for, for the secondary, a lot of belief that there's going to be guys that could be next level, maybe even guys that could come out uh, after, you know, one season. And we, we saw we saw a lot of breakdowns over there where we start thinking about the things that will need to be corrected on that portion. What would you like to see you know, any particular guys that you'd like to see more of? Um, yeah, Deshaun Jameson needs to be Deshaun Jameson. You know, this time last year on where I was the guy saying, I think he might be pound for pound. Take Bijan out of the equation, I guess. But other than Bijan, he might be pound for pound the best player on this Texas team. That was what I was saying last year. He didn't live up to that last year. He had a down year. I think he, he certainly has it in him to have a bounce back year. You need Deshaun Jameson to be Deshaun Jameson. <laughs> you know, we talk about, Anthony Cook and Jody Barron and Jaron Thompson, the guys on campus. I tell you what, man, after talking to uh, Ryan Watts, his high school coach, um, a couple weeks ago at Little Elm, he's, he talks about Ryan Watts as a first-round draft pick, that kind of potential, the, Ryan Watts being the transfer from Ohio State, of course. Um, 6'3", uh, I mean, just does it all, anything you can ask. He can play outside at corner. He can – play at safety. So, um, <laughs> uh, give the other, give the other man a chance, but, uh, I think Ryan Watts has a chance on war to maybe be a guy that we're not talking about enough. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe it was just his head coach, but I actually called his coach. I was interviewing him about Terrence Brooks, the, uh, who, who could also be a key part of this secondary, right? He's a true freshman. He's on early and rolly. And I said, Hey, while, while I got gotcha, you, what are your thoughts on Ryan? And, he almost gushed about Ryan Watts more than he did Terrence Brooks, which was mm-hmm. a little surprising to me. So, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. in fact, he said to me, and I put this in, the, I think it was the war room last week, or maybe my three, two, one, he fully expects both of those guys to be starters this year. Now, listen, that's their high school coach talking, but he knows them better than anybody. And I mean, these guys were elite prospects. So would it shock any of us if 
both uh, Terrence Brooks and Ryan Watts were starting for Texas at some point? I don't think so. But uh, I think I think you need Deshaun Jameson to, to kind of bounce back to what we know he can do. And I think if Ryan Watts is kind of as good as what I'm maybe suddenly expecting him to be, I think that'll be a big help for the back end of that uh, that Texas defense. All right, Jerry. <laughs> I didn't. I, wanted, I did not want Keenan to have to get into the minutia as a guy who's only been uh, working here for a couple of months. So, and then we had some technical difficulties to start off on. So, I will come to you, Keenan. Keenan Womack. He, he's not the other guy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> damn it, Jerry! He couldn't handle the heat. <laughs> well, he heard his name and he he, so, he dipped so what, out of here. This that's why we didn't, hadn't gone to him because he's been having some technical issues. And I was hoping that uh, it wouldn't happen, but he, here it is. So, all right. Well, I was just going to switch to basketball, but we won't do that. So, Jason, I'll switch. Go back to you then. From a recruiting perspective, uh, what's going on in, in the uh, the recruiting uh, thing? And by the way, someone he says someone. One of you guys need to mute your microphone. I don't know what you're hearing in the in the background uh, over there, but. Um, I've got nothing. I've got no kids today. So, uh, Jason, from a recruiting perspective, uh, what's what you got going on? Not a lot. How much time do I need to fill here? Because uh... <laughs> thirty minutes? No, not not much time. <laughs> really much dig time. deep. Um, you know, the biggest news on War is that uh, dead period ended March first. So mm-hmm. we're going to start seeing guys take visits. Um, Oklahoma is going to have some some visitors this weekend. I think Colton Vosset, the, the defensive lineman out of Westlake that uh, Texas fans are so enamored with. His dad played at Texas. He's going to be at Oklahoma this weekend. A couple guys are going to LSU this weekend. Um, Texas isn't having like a big rush of recruits coming in this weekend, but we're going to see. Uh, there's a couple guys that told me they might come in next weekend, uh, late in March. I mean, you were on top of uh, Arch Manning coming in for a multi-day visit in late March. They're going to have some other players coming in. I think for Texas, it'll probably really heat up once they start spring practices towards the end of the month, but you'll see some guys trickle in and out uh, of Austin right now, uh, Mm -hmm. or now that the dead period is lifted. So, you know, things are starting to pick up a little bit. Um, Cole Patterson, our other guy at Orange Bloods who helps with recruiting, he and I'll be kind of busy. As I look at my calendar in March, we've got, uh, there's an Under Armour camp. There's seven on seven events up in Dallas. Um, so it's going to really start picking up in terms of access to players, seeing players, evaluating them, of course, talking to them. And then we'll towards more towards the later part of the month. I think we'll see a rush of guys coming in to take visits, uh, unofficial visits, visits to, to Texas. You know, I know we've talked a lot about Arch, um, but we haven't talked a little bit in a little bit of time about Ruben Owens. How how is it crucial to get him back on campus in the in the spring at all? In your opinion, uh, Jason, or has he been here enough where it's not that as important? Yeah, you know, Ruben's been to Texas a bunch. Ruben's been everywhere, man. He as a recruit, he does his homework and he gets out mm-hmm. and sees a lot of places. So um, it ne- it never hurts. Excuse me, uh, to get a guy on campus. I mean, the more times you do it, the better. So I think where it's key with Ruben on more is that he has specifically mentioned he wants to play or he'd like to play with Arch Manning, right? So if you can get him on, listen, if Ruben Owens picks up the phone and says, hey, coach, I want to come by tomorrow, you say, come on up, right? But if you can work it out perfectly in a perfect world where maybe he's at that same practice that Arch Manning is at and they can kind of talk, you know, visualize playing together and John T. Cook and uh, even David Hicks, DJ Hicks is a defensive lineman who's been talking to Arch. He told Orange Bloods uh, this week. So, um, yeah, to answer your question, it's not critical. I think Texas could win the Reuben Owens race without getting him on campus a bunch more. Mm-hmm. You're going to need him to take an official visit, probably, of course. But, uh, but I, you know, I think they could win the race without getting him on back on campus a whole bunch more times. But you certainly would love to see him back in Austin if you're a Texas fan. The more times he comes, the better the chances are. And then for for Ruben, has he given a, a timetable at all, or are, do you think Ruben likes being recruited so much that he might wait until the very end? Yeah, I do think. Uh, I think he he's probably even if he commits early. With let me back up, he he doesn't have a firm timetable that he's ever told me. Okay, he just said, "Hey, he's not going to rush into." Remember, he was committed to Texas once before, opened up his recruitment. Right, so. 
I don't think he wants to rush into a decision again. And Ruben likes the recruiting process. I said it, man. He likes to take visits and, you know, he's been to Alabama and Georgia and Southern Cal. He told me he wants to get to Michigan and Oregon. I mean, he wants to go all over the place and Hey, more, more power to you, man. Mm -hmm. Go do your homework. So, um, I'd be mildly surprised to see Ruben Owens commit early. And I think even if he commits early on, Mark, he's going to be a guy that we'll be talking about all the way until signing day in December, maybe even February. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I don't think it really matters if he commits early. I think he'll be a conversation piece pretty much every week throughout this recruiting process. Outside of, outside of those two, who would, be, who would you say, Jason, would be the other guys that you think would be key to getting on campus uh, this spring? Um, you know, I mentioned David Hicks. He's the number one player in the uh, in the state, number two in the country. I mean, Texas is probably playing a little bit from behind there. Right? Most people think A and M, Oklahoma. So, you know, Texas is in the mix. They need to get him on campus. Uh, you know, they've got to find some wide receivers. Jonte Cook, uh, I think. Jonte being the receiver from uh, DeSoto, that Texas has got to get him in. Jacquez Petaway is another ultra talented receiver. Um, you know, I, I think Anthony Hill's a linebacker. I mean, I'm just trying to think of the positions where they have a strong, strong need. Mm -hmm. Anthony Hill really likes Texas, but there's a lot when schools like Alabama and, and others are heavily involved there as well. So, I mean, Texas has to get guys like that on campus to try to separate themselves from some of these programs. Uh, one more I'll mention JV and Toviano, who's a uh, defensive back out of Arlington Lamar, cornerback. Uh, again, Texas is in the mix there, but they're not the leaders, right? They're in the mix. You've got to get those guys on campus at least one more time, probably multiple times, if you want to climb into that that driver's seat position. So um, those are a few of the names. I mean, those are the elite of the elite guys in the state that, that Texas is in contention for. Um, don't know what I'd call Texas a leader for any of them. But they're, they're in the mix for all of them, right? So uh, getting those guys on campus would be big. And, you know, similar into that regard, whenever we look at the board, I feel like it's so consistent that we see the comparison of Texas recruiting class to Texas A&M last year, where Texas A&M was the top class and everyone's saying, oh, you know, Texas needs one of those class if we want to make it to the top again, whatever. So with the potential of landing an Arch Manning, you know, maybe along with an Owens and a Cook, what's the ceiling of this Texas class? I know it's very early to where it's hard to say entirely what Texas could be in the rankings, but if they are able to land an Arch Manning and then able to kind of have that domino effect on the rest of the class, how high do you think this recruiting class could be? Well, yeah, that's a good question, Michael. Um, I mean, in a perfect world, right, if everything came together, it could be the number one recruiting class in the country. Am I predicting that? Absolutely not. So don't make any mistake about it. I would think right now, top 10-ish, you'd be pretty happy. I mean, Texas doesn't have a lot of recruiting momentum right now. They just don't. Guys are taking a wait and see approach, but if you get in a perfect world, let's say Arch Manning commits early, right? <clears throat> That's going to cause some other players to want to come with him. Probably Reuben Owens, probably uh, John Tay Cook. Uh, I think you'd see some other guys. Those are the kind of the main three that we always talk about, but I think you'd see some other guys follow Arch Manning in a perfect world. If they could get DJ Hicks again, then you're talking, Texas would have the number one player in the country and Arch Manning, the number two player in the country and DJ Hicks. Someone said in, on our message board this year, this week, uh, I forget which thread it was, but they said, hey, that kind of re resembles uh, when they got Chris Sims, the number one player in the country, <clears throat> an out-of-state quarterback, and they got Corey Redding, the big in-state defensive lineman who was a number two player in the country. They got the best player on both sides of the ball. Texas is in the mix for the best player on both sides of the ball. they just got to close some of these recruitments out. But, you know, in a in a perfect world, again, I don't expect this, but if you're asking me, hey, if all the pieces came to together, could they have a class like Texas A&M did last year? Yeah, they absolutely could. Um, but a lot of that stems from, A, you got to get Arch Manning. You've got to win some recruitments that you're probably trailing in right now. And then the bigger thing, maybe the biggest thing, you've got to play well on the field in the fall to help build some of that momentum, maintain that momentum, uh, and then just kind of ride that hot streak into December. All right, guys. Well, look, I just, it's the three of us. Uh, Keenan has dropped out, so there's no need to uh, drag this thing out. So why don't we just go ahead and start getting in some some parting shots here. Mike, you, since you are the rookie here, you get to go uh, first. You are batter on deck. Go ahead and give us some of your, your the final thoughts here. 
Yeah, so I know that this was a expected basketball show in regards to Keenan's appearance, and then some tough situations technical-wise just didn't happen. But uh, I am really excited to see what's going to happen with this Big 12 tournament. I think Texas has had their moments where they look like one of the better teams in the Big 12. They've obviously had their moments where they have struggled as well. But the Big 12 is an absolute circus in terms of just trying to navigate it because of all the talent that exists in the conference. So I'm very excited to see what happens with this Texas team. I think if they're a team that's able to get into that final four of the Big 12, maybe even championship the Big 12, and I'm not saying they can't win it. I'm just saying if they can get in that range, then I think they're going to be a comfortable five-seater above, and I'm really excited to see what happens with this team come the tournament. Uh, yeah, not only that team, but the, the women's team, by the way, who you know got the revenge on Kansas last night at, uh, with a good, good solid win over there. So both of those teams – uh, are doing some, you know, shout out to the ladies as well. Um, Jason, what about yourself? Um, I don't have anything prepared on more. Uh, just been you know, one of these crazy, oh, do we yeah, do we ever, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, uh, you guys heard the story last night. So, uh, we have two puppies, one of them's really young, maybe four months, and the other one's, I guess, almost a year and a half now, but um, the year and a half year old pup, still a pup. We had to take him to the vet the other day. He's just not feeling well and he's not eating, just all this other shit. Now, $310 later, they sent us home with some medicine and said he had an infection. Well, that was Tuesday. I think Tuesday we took him in. Yeah. And then last night, our four month old pup, his stomach looked like it was about to explode, man. It was, and he was, he was just kind of hiding. He was in pain. He was whimpering. So thankfully, there's a after hours vet clinic that just just opened like a week ago but right down the road from our house so i told my wife I was like, eh, let's take the stupid dog there so he somehow got into the food bin i always say like he's a dumbass dog he just did but <laughs> he's pretty smart when it comes to food man because mm -hmm. he finds ways to get in that pantry and like get into the dog bones well somehow he got into the food bin that's like a tupperware bin that's closed right we don't know when we don't know how we don't know how none of us saw it between me and my wife and our four kids. How the hell this happened? But he just ate so much food out of that bin mm -hmm. that he just, I forget what they said the term was, but just food gorged himself. So, hey, that $350, $340 later, I was like $650 in, in a two-day span on these fucking dogs. Part of my expression. I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> whose bright idea was to get two dogs? So, uh my wife and I, we have our 20-year anniversary uh, this Wednesday. So Nice. Yeah, well, it was. I was trying to make plans for this weekend and maybe do something nice. And I just told her last night, I was like, happy anniversary, because we, we ain't doing shit for our anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> 650 bucks on those dogs. So it's been one of those weeks. Man. I feel like an Alex. I, I need Alex here to uh, console me, man. Our uh, water softener is, is out. I'm going to have to get oh, that oh replaced. Um, our fence is down. So my neighbor and I've been talking. We're gonna have to get that replaced. Like uh, we're gonna split it, of course, but it's gonna be pretty costly. So it's one like last night when my wife said that about the dog, I was like, I'm just ready to effing break something. But the good news is the dogs are fine. They're all gonna be fine. But uh, it's been been one of those weeks, man. So there, there's my my parting shot rant. <laughs> I love I love the rant. And by the way, congratulations. Uh, your wife deserves as, as many <laughs> gifts as possible for putting up for you for 20 years. So. Well, I just, Omar, you and I talked, I took her out last, her birthday was last Friday. We went out, I, I made the mistake of, you got Valentine's Day, she's got a February 25th birthday and then a March 9th anniversary. It kicks my ass every year, man. So, um, yeah. Yes, you're right. She she deserves a gold star and then some for putting putting up with my shit. You're absolutely <laughs> That's 20 Nobody years. would argue that. 20 years, she will have an extra jewel in her crown when she gets to heaven. Um, my, my, Jason, you'll pre, you will appreciate my, my party shot. And Mike, you will at, at some point. Hopefully, it will be many years down the line because this is going to be kid-related. So this is, you know, you'll appreciate this years down the line. Uh, Jason, you'll appreciate this right now. I got to give props, Jason, to uh, my oldest son, Maximus, who uh, successfully navigated his first AAU basketball tryout and actually made a team. Um, and so just just found that out this week and uh, up there at Sky Skyhook up in Pflugerville. So I uh, got, just got a schedule yesterday of, of places. Thank God. 
they're not doing like, you know, tons and tons of traveling. I mean, I don't want to do all that in third grade. Like, I think that's a little bit of overkill. So, but a couple of things. So really, really excited to, to, to have, you know, work with him, have trainers and all this other type of stuff. And then to progress to this point. So I'm like, looking forward to getting into what your world was of getting polos and traveling and all these other oh, kinds yeah. of things. Yeah. So that's my party shot. Well, good, good for good for Max, dude. Congrats. That's very cool. All right. Well, listen, Congrats. next cool. next week we have definitely um, what does it say? LeVar. <laughs> oh, um, let, let me tell you, that, my LeVar moment is really this. I have two boys, Maximus and Titan. Titans are the youngest, but the youngest will be greater than the oldest. Like, if you want my LeVar ball, just you know, per, just talking about my kids, you watch out for the youngest one. The youngest one's gonna be the one. That I'm gonna take over. I'm gonna withdraw him uh, from school as a, as in his teenage years. We're gonna go overseas, uh, and and, <laughs> and that's that's that is clearly what's going to happen. So uh, just get ready for that. Uh, but yes, we'll have J- we'll have catch back next week. Alex will probably be back next week. Michael, thank you for filling in. You did a fantastic job. Very knowledgeable, Michael Rockman. Very knowledgeable. We got to get you on a little bit more. Get your own segments too. Actually, Michael, you do have them. You've had you do your sh- you do some of the shorts uh, that are on here. So uh, make sure you check that out. Make sure you check out the, the good content that's here on, on Orange Buds. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends. We appreciate you guys checking in and, and doing what you do and checking us out as weekly. We'll have more content this week. Until later, until then, you guys take take care. Peace out.